Then with this 39th uh, Torah portion, Hukat, Hukat, um, or the, the ordinance, the decree of the red heifer, of the red heifer. Now, here we want to connect this, um, the red heifer with Miriam in chapter 19. We have in chapter 19 of Numbers, which is a portion of this week's, uh, this, this, this Sabbatical um, Torah portion number 39. And um, we have the red heifer, where there's this statue or this ordinance, which is more popularly known as the ordinance of the red heifer. And in Judaism, it's called para aduma. Now, para would be for the heifer, and, and, and the aduma, the aduma is for the red. Now, of course, if we go into para and paron, paron, we have Pharaoh. Now in pre dynastic in pre dynastic um Egypt many historians and it is pretty much to be true that um pre dynastic Egypt was based on a cattle was based on cattle and the cow, both in the male form of the bull and in the female form of the milk, the milk cow, or the heifer, you understand, or the heifer, and thus we have right here in symbology, this particular, um, the cow's horn, right here, or someone say the bull's horn, the cow's horn, and the solar disc. Now, what's the link with Miriam? When we get to chapter 20, when we turn to chapter 20, we find that Miriam, Miriam, and I want to focus on that Hebrew, the difference between Miriam and Mariam. There's a difference between Mariam and Miriam. Now, we find this different difference especially in the Hebrew Torah. Now, why do we find in the Hebrew Torah? Because in the Torah was the re coding or the um, the upgrade from ancient Egypt. Something was going on in ancient Egypt at the time of the Exodus and before the Exodus. You might have heard of the Unkenunten or the Akaten, um, his reformations where um, in his time there was an evil priesthood, there was a moon priesthood, and so what Unkenunten did or Akhenaten did was he some say he invented um, monotheism, or he is the first monotheist. Now, this is from a, a modern Eurocentric or Gentile or white Western um, interpretation. Now, that interpretation is less than is less than 200, you know, let's say it less than 200 years old. But this symbology here is very important. This symbology is the link now both between Miriam, right, the sister of Moses and Haron, and what we have in this Torah portion, Hukat, or Yehigu Tizat, Yehino, what we have in this particular portion with the red heifer, this ritual, this one for all time ritual. This was not a ritual that, according to the scripture, was to be continually repeated. But this particular ritual was a once for all time. And, and we went over that, you know, in pretty much detail in the earlier portions. Here we want to focus on the second and the third matter. And the second and third matter is Miriam's death, the death of Mary or Miriam, Old Testament Miriam, and the water from the rock. Because what we learn in chapter 20 of Numbers, and let's just bring up the scripture. Let's just bring up the scripture right here in chapter 20. So we're using this for a, a symbolic, using Hathor for a symbolic of Miriam. Because Miriam um, was the Hathor of the Israelites. And perhaps even perhaps greater than just of the Israelites, 
when we really now put it into its proper context. Because then this will explain um, Miriam's attitude coming out of Egypt. Because in Egypt, both Aaron as well as Miriam, they were of the priesthood, the priesthood of the Hebrew or the Hebrews. Now Moses, he was a runaway in a sense, what happened with Moses and him going away. But what Moses gained, he gained an insight into the overstanding of the true of the true faith, the Yahweh faith, the Yahweh faith. In other words, the Yahweh faith comes right out of the root of the Nile. In other words, right out of Ethiopia to the first colony Egypt, where for the pre dynastic ages you understand it existed in that purity, and this is what a lot of the Egyptologists talk about the Golden Age. But then, from the Golden Age, as we have in Donnell, Donnell's the vision of Nebuchadnezzar that was interpreted by Donnell explains it to us where the head of this idol was gold, then we come to silver, and then we come to bronze, and um. Then we come down to you know, yeah, to bronze and then to iron, and then we come down to a mix of iron and clay. This is the last part when we come to this dark age. And now the rise of white supremacy, biblically, scripturally, was the beginning of humanity's dark age, or let's call it as it is, time of ignorance the age of ignorance. This is why so much about this, when we look at early European interpretation, so much about this has been distorted and now there's a frantic effort to upgrade based on the more Afrocentric and the Afro-Shemitic true interpretation. But there were a few Europeans who got it. One of them was Gerald Macy. And we have a little clip here from Gerald Macy's A Book of the Beginning, roughly on page 116. And it says right here, it says right here, it says, the goddess Mer, and, and, and you can put quotation marks around goddess, because, you know, there's this false Western Gentile Greco-Roman perspective to goddess. Let's call it a feminine divine attribute, like wisdom. Wisdom in the Afro-Shemitic and the African and the Hebraic languages has a gender. Many, many things have genders within the true language, within the, even the Masoretic Torah as well as the Ethiopic um, Octetek or the Orit, as well as the pure language of the Emperor's Bible, the Metaph Kedus of Negus Neges Haile Selassie I. But here we have the goddess or the feminine attribute, myrrh, is likewise found in a form of Hathor. So this part of the name is very important as well because we're going to come to Miriam, right? Now the goddess or the divine attribute, the feminine attribute, you understand? Or we could say the female saint, myrrh, is likewise found as a form of Hathor as a form of what's known as Hathor or Chet Kharu. And the Egyptologists will tell us that Chet Kharu means the house of Kharu or the house of Horus. From an Ethiopic perspective, Chet Kharu or Chet Kharu would be the sister of the chosen or the sister, the chosen, the chosen sister. Now, this would also, once again, link with Miriam. This would be a clear link with Miriam. Remember the whole, um, the different scenes in the scripture when the people were saying, um, does God, does Elohim, does the Netaru, the divine attributes, only speak through Moses and not through us, Israelites? You understand? As well as the jealousy or the speaking against Moses' Ethiopian wife, and we'll use um, this uh, T right here, the Nubian queen of Egypt, as a, as a convenient stand-in right here. 
Now, what's interesting is that we know from the scripture that um, uh, Zipporah, Zipporah, which her name means little bird, like a dindi, which is kind of curious and interesting as well when we look into ancient Egypt and we look into their, their um, spirituality or their religion or their metaphysical interpretation that symbolic of the bird even within the offset culture that the Europeans call a cult alright so we have um, there's another picture right here that we want to highlight as well let's see if we can bring it up and we're using some of these available this right here is the red chapel of um, Hatshepsut now according to our reconstruction Hatshepsut was Pharaoh's daughter who adopted Musa or Mashu Moses. Now, what's curious too is that when we look into the Old um, Testament and we look into, we'll use this as a stand-in for for uh, Zipporah because there's a controversy in the Scripture. We can call it the Miriam versus. Um, Zipporah some say it was a chick fight it wasn't really a chick fight but so you can understand it y'all nowadays in the so called 21st 21st century so you can understand it but what was what was really behind this the European would tell us that what was behind this was the fact that like they try to tell us that Miriam because they say that they were Jews that Miriam was a Jewish so, but she wasn't only really of Judah, she was of the tribe of Levi, so Miriam could not be a Jew because she was not of the tribe of Judah, she was of the tribe of Lewi, as was her brothers Aaron or Haron and Mashu or Musa or Moshe, Moses. So, they try to tell us that Miriam was white and therefore they try to concede a little bit the black presence by saying, look, Moses married an Ethiopian woman. You understand? So this is the black person in the Bible, but really all of them were what we would call today black. You understand? The majority of the people of the Bible were black. You understand? It's only in the latter parts of the Old Testament and coming into the New Testament do we see this um, clean leper or the European. Remember the sign to Moses with the hand in his bosom and he took his hand out and it was his other flesh and then he he took it, he took put his hand in his bosom and when he pulled out it was leprous white as snow and then he puts it inside and turned back to his other flesh. So there's a contrast. Remember what Yahweh says to Mashu. He says that he's going to show you a sign. Right? And he says, in the latter days, we would overstand these signs. And now in these latter days of this time cycle, this age, we're beginning to overstand these signs. Now, in chapter 12, we have the incident where Aaron, Haron, and, and uh, Miriam speak against Moses' Ethiopian wife, Sipara or Zipporah. And in particular, the one who Yahweh focuses on is Miriam. And Miriam was turned leprous, and she was put outside the camp. Now, something I found very interesting, and this is a little bit of a, not a point aside, but I think we need to include this at this particular point. And this is in one of the, the newer works that we've published, um, the Ethiopic Legends of Our Lady Mary and while we were preparing for this particular um, lesson and this particular um, Torah portion um, in the hard copy that we published we came across page 22 in the Mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the history of Hannah and we want to share this with you because it says right here it is customary for the word of God to be heard, to be hard, excuse me, hard to understand. Even when it's heard, it's hard to understand or overstand. And his handiwork 
to be marvelous. And he first of all maketh trial. He maketh a trial of man. Now, some would say, well, God doesn't test. Well, you see what they're doing? They're not properly interpreting that verse. It says that God is not tested by evil, nor does he test or tempt anyone. The context is with evil. So the test of the Almighty are not tests or temptations of evil. They are tests of his goodness, you know what I'm saying, of his barakat. But it's based on the free will or the free choice of the individual. So, yes, John makes a trial of a man for his good. As a man trieth gold in the fire, so doth, even so doth God, or John, if you please, try his chosen one. The key there in the good is, is the Chiruyan, the Chiruyan, or the Horuses. Um, in ancient Egypt, they would call them the Shemsu Cheru or the Shemsu Horus. Those are the followers of the chosen ones or the followers of the chosen path, which was in the ancient times the Yahweh's path or the way of Jah, the way of Yahweh. Many would like you to believe that Jah is like a new God that Moses dreamt up. But what Moses discovered, he discovered how his people were in a religious bondage not only the Hebrews but many of the Egyptians so when Moses and the Israelites came out we find in the scripture that also a mixed multitude came out with them now there's another pick right here that we'll use as a stand-in for this coming out this exodus right here right this particular exodus we use this particular um painting right here. They, they call this the black fowls. They call this the black fowls. They try to imply that there were fowls who were not black when they said the black fowls. What they mean is the Nehesia, in other words, the ones from Ethiopia or the ones from the root land, the origin land, the land of origin. So what Mashu or Muse, to Hut Muse originally, but Mashu, Moses, what he did is when he ran after that murder, after the, after the killing incident, right? He ran, and some say this will be the time when Hatshepsut, his sister, or his adopted mother was on the throne, right? But remember, he had a, a brother, and that would be Tehutmosis the third. We'll get into that and connect this and really tie this in, and this is where the story really becomes very interesting. A lot of these things that are hard to understand in the Bible, they become clear because we're looking at it then and now in the context of the particular time and taking out the whitewashing. You understand? So Moses, right, Moses went to the south or the Median land. Even the Talmud of the modern day European Jews bears witness to the fact that Moses went to Ethiopia and even Moses was a general in the Ethiopian armies when the Ethiopian armies went against the Egyptian armies and gained victories. All right? And now there's further evidence in addition to that, but that's very interesting that even they testify to that Ethiopian, that Ethiopic connection. Now some say, well, this perhaps is the link for him meeting um, Jethro or Yotor as well as um, his Ethiopian wife or wives. Some speculate that Moses didn't just have one wife based on a particular interpretation of the text, but that Moses really had two wives or two Ethiopian wives. Now that's interesting. That's somewhat up for speculation and that's not our focus at this particular time. But be that as it may, let's keep that placeholder right there. So, moving forward, as a man tries gold in the fire in order to see whether, how much gold and how much alloy is there, whether it's pure gold, you understand? Because gold is a noble, make, take note of that, gold is a noble element. Not an ignoble element, gold is a noble element. Even so, and its, it's scientific acronym is, is AU like African unit, 
something to think about, or like the all, the all, in all set, which means true. Even so, doth God try his chosen ones by suffering and by misery. Now, Hannah, Hannah was born in sin. Now, we're speaking about Hannah. Now, what's interesting to note about Hannah is that Hannah, the mother of this in Grumarium, her name means grace in the Hebrew. And it's also found in many Hebraic names like Johannes. Johannes. Eo for Yah. Yahweh contracted is Eo. Eo or Johannes. Actually, Eo is a contraction of Yahweh, and Yo is a contraction of Eo. All right? So it says, now, Hannah was born in sin, chat and in sin she ate her food, and ha Elohim trieth her, first of all, so that he might at length remove oppression, remove oppression from all the tribes of Israel. Israel. Now, it's interesting right here. Remove what? Oppression, downpression. He knew the patience of her mind under manifold sorrow and suffering, and he gave to her a beautiful and twofold reward. I want you to highlight that there and to make a note of that, that twofold part. Remember we said that sin is twofold, has twofold aspects. One fold aspect of sin is the guilt. That's the guilt trip. And, and it's so important for you all to understand this. Because a lot of folks accept the truth of the King of Kings, accept Yeshua, but then have this great battle in their heart and mind with this guilt thing, with this guilt trip. Satan, Hashatan uses that to try to keep you in a frozen psychological state. You understand? Now, sin is twofold. You know what I'm saying? Sin has a twofold aspect. And what we're going to learn about right here, which concerns, which concerns uh, the, red, the red cow or the red heifer. Remember, the cow is one which has not, or the heifer rather, is, one, is, a, is a cow that has not given birth. Now, why is that important in our story? Because I don't think you'll be able to find any husband of Miriam in the scripture, nor any time it mentioned any child, male or female, that Miriam had. Now, why is that important? Well, why that's important is because let's look at Gerald, what Gerald Macy says right here. Gerald Macy says that the goddess Mir. Now, think about this for a moment. They came out of Egypt, and we know that Moses and his family, they were up there in the establishment, you know, Moses, his sister, his mother, you understand, um, his mother was, was, was actually his wet nurse, and according to the interpretation, the sister who's unnamed in the early part of Shemot, or the Hebrew book of, of, of Exodus, or Ritzetzat, she also is in the immediate environment and service of the of the royalty. I saw a picture here. Now this is one of their bogus pictures, so artists out there, you know, ones that have artistic skills and may wanna, you know, work on some of these artworks that we need as our teaching tools. Let's see if we can bring this one up here. We saw this particular um artwork here on on Miriam. Now that symbol right there, the three of them Keep that in mind right there. We're going to prove now, one would we'll say that's the Egyptian trinity. Yes, it's the Egyptian trinity, but it's also Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. You understand? They were the Hebrew Egyptian trinity. You understand? That was instrumental in that deliverance. You understand? The supporting characters to Moses' Moses's was his sister, and his brother. This is why they came to Aaron to build a, 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 a golden calf. Think about it for a moment. Because he knew how. Why? What did he do in Egypt? Some say the Hebrew were artisans. The Hebrew were jewelers. 
you know, within the Hebrew were craftsmen, the Hebrews were craftsmen. Another interesting point is when God first reveals himself to the Israelites, he doesn't say, I am the God of Israel. He says, tell them the God of the Hebrews. Now, the Hebrews or the Hebrew is a particular order of ancient Egyptian priesthood. You understand? Know some, some call it the Shem priest, right? The Shem. Remember in the Bible it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Now, white people, Europeans, not understanding, being rather young in comparison to the Afro-Shemitic peoples, they say that this Shem was a racial type. So there you get the Ham, Ham Shem, and Japheth kind of a thing. But Shem means name, and Shem as Shum, it means the one that has the appointment. In other words, each of the children of Noch, and Noch relates to the Ankh, right? The Noch, because a Noch means to be Rejajim as a long time, or a high mountain. It's called, it's called um, in the, in the good is Noch, from that, or, or a Noch, something that is a long, when we say in 23rd Psalm, um, um, all the days of my life I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That idea of all the days, a long period of time. So we see another link with the, the internal idea of the Ankh symbolizing life, but also symbolizing longevity of days. And that's all within the cycle, the cosmology, and the ages. You know, in that link with the ages. Now, when the Israelites came forward as a particular age. There's a particular turning point of the age like this particular turning point of the age that we're in. So here's this picture right here I was telling you about Miriam, Fowl's daughter sees the baby Moses. This is how the Europeans conceived of it. And we need to um, reconceive of this in the proper type. It, it, you can see what they're doing right here, right? So they're saying that this right here perhaps was um, um, Moses' sister, who they say is Miriam. I put a question mark there, because I really think that that sister was perhaps another sister. And the killing of this, uh, of this Egyptian, right, of this Egyptian because of the incident that happened, that's very much veiled, has something to do with something happening to that sister or another sister. Now, I'm not the first one to really, you know, um, I would say stumble on this, but to come across on this particular idea, Velikovsky, when he speaks about the 12th dynasty literature, you might see that out there, Moses and the 12th dynasty literature. It's out there. Google it. Check out the pages for yourself. All right? But let's get into this a little bit more. So the point which we're seeking to make right here is that the conventional or Eurocentric view that we have of... Um, of the whole Bible, but especially these seminal, these early stories, actually is what contributes to this particular confusion. All right? Miriam's role, as well as Aaron's role in ancient Egypt, this is one of the reasons why they seem to have had a little problem with Yahweh or Jah, Jah Adonai, always communicating with Mashu and not communicating with them. They almost felt left out of the loop. And then, in consequence, they took it out on Moses' Ethiopian wife because they knew that Moses got initiated in the schools of what they call upper, what they call upper Egypt, which is to say Ethiopia, which is to say the roots, which is to say the truth. The overs and even in this picture right here, you see what... Um, you see what this Queen T was standing for us right now for Zippor. She's holding right here. She's holding right here. She's holding right here. You can see the the flail. You understand? Which is also a, a, a symbol of of power. Not the shepherd's rod, not the hexus rod of the shepherd, but that rod of we could say kingship. You understand? Kingship. And Moses reigned or ruled as king. And we'll show you that even within the, I think Deuteronomy, it says, and, and he, he was a king, he was a king in Jeshurun, 
another kind of cryptic name, Jeshrun. We have Jeshrun. Who is Jeshrun? Yeshrun. If you look at the etymology, it links with Asa or Asha, Osiris, in a very, very um, cryptic and interesting way. But let's continue with the Blessed, the blessed um, Virgin Mary, the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we find right here where it says that he knew the patience of her mind under manifold sorrow and suffering, and he gave to her a beautiful and a twofold, and that's the, that's the ma'at right there, that's that twofold, the two truths, that twofold reward, which no man can take away from her. We have that in our liturgy where it says of this in the Mariam, you are virgin in what? Mind, and you are virgin in body. Therefore, if you can be virgin in mind, if a mind can renew, then the body can renew as well. The prophets and the Begot said, through much labor and suffering, you must enter into the kingdom of heaven. Through much labor and suffering, we must enter into the kingdom of heaven. Acts chapter 14 and 22. And this prophecy, this tin beat, was fulfilled in Hannah. For she endured patiently all her burden and all the heat, all the heat of the day. And because of this, she inherited the kingdom of heaven. Now here's a particular point that I wanted to link about Miriam that the Holy Spirit showed me before we got into this 39th Torah portion, Hukai. It says right here, Now the kingdom of heaven, the Mengista Semayat, of which I speak, is the son of Hannah's daughter, Mary. That is to say, our Lord and Redeemer, Jesus Christos, Yeshua HaMoshiach, Jesus Christ, our black Lord and Savior. For many have desired to receive to Kabbalah, to Kabbalah, to Makabal, the majesty and the honor, the majesty and the honor of Hannah, by calling their daughters Mary. So many have, have sought to kind of tap into that. Now, this is what's very interesting about this, because this also connects when we look into ancient Egypt and to the ancient Egyptian religion. In other words, one's naming oneself like even Hatshepsut, uh, I think, um, with the daughter of the daughter of the wife, I think, of Amun, to to be a consort in that sense for the god, or the next best thing to be the mother. You understand of that child. You see, so when we talk about the golden calf, that was the golden child. Now when we're speaking about the red heifer. We're speaking about that cow female cow that has not given birth to any calf. Now this is a connection with Miriam because the red heifer occurs in the 19th chapter of Numbers and then in the 20th chapter, verse 1, we all of a sudden hear about Miriam's death, that, that Mary dies. And in verse 2 we find out there is no water. Very interesting. Now, this connection with water, because in chapter 19, we learn of the water of lustration, the water of separation, which cleanses from sin, which cleanses from sin, which is a type of Christ as that ground, as that Aduma or the Adama, the Adam was drawn from the Adama, according to the Hebrew mystery. So now we have the Para Aduma or the Red Heifer. Now, it says that many have desired to receive the majesty and honor, and that's also Kabbalistic if you look at the tree, majesty and honor is on the tree, of Hana, and Hana means grace, by calling their daughters Mary, by a type of a sympathetic magic. Even as Yaakobed, or Jacobed, or Yaakobad, Yaakovod, Yaakovod in the Hebrew mean the glory of Jah, and in the Ethiopic it would mean that Jah is kabod, he is serious, he's heavy. You understand? Calling her first daughter by that name. And he, when we say he now, we're speaking of the law. 
We're speaking of the living Torah. And we'll bring this particular art, I don't know if you've seen this art before, but this particular art, more front and center. And why we're bringing this particular art front and center is because of what we're reading right here, right? And now we, we're going to parallel, we're going to parallel in a sense, um, Miriam in her Hathor type with Mariam, you understand? Where it says right here that that um, Jacobed, the mother of 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 Mary and Aaron and 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 um, Moses, calling her first daughter by that name, and he he is Yeshua, he is Torah, Torah, he is Torah, calling her Miriam. So Jacobed called her daughter. Miriam, or according to Macy right here, we have the goddess Myrrh. The goddess Myrrh is likewise found in a form of Hathor, bearing the solar disk on her, quote, her fear neck. Now, Yahweh, John, through the prophets, he uses this same type to describe um, Ephraim, Afarim, Ephraim, right? Her fear neck, and he speaks about how Ephraim went back to Egypt and connect with the whole big connection in Hosea and throughout the scriptures with Egypt because in Isaiah he says, Egypt is my people. So she's bearing now the solar disc on her fear neck, that is to say, between the cow's horns. She's not bear and so when you look at ancient Egyptian um, iconography, you get to see that there where the cow would be carrying, or even the bull will be carrying that solar disc, right, between the cow's horn. Now, the young goddess of Amu is represented in Israel, representing in Israel by Miriam. So that young goddess of Amu, and some say Ami means the people, Amu could mean his people, or Amo, is represented, so his people, God's people, represented in Israel by Miriam. But now in the Ethiopic legend of Our Lady Mary, our, our new publication, page 22, it says that many have, have desired, had a desire similar to when Haywan was deceived and she looked at that tree and it became one desirable to make her wise to receive the majesty and honor of Hannah by calling their daughters Mary, even as Jacob had called her first daughter by that name, and he, the law, Yeshua, called her Miriam. You know what I'm saying? Called her Miriam because Mary was unsuitable for her. Maryam was unsuitable. So we have Meraraam, Meraraamu, and we have Mar, Mar, honey. Right, and then we have bitter and honey. We have a play on bitter and honey in Miriam and Mariam as well, especially from the Ethiopic, from the root, right? And this is where Moses went to. That's why Acts of Apostles 7.22 says that Moses was learned in the, in the wisdom of the Egypts, and he was mighty in word and deed because he came with the true Amen, not like the counterfeit Amun, priesthood of that particular time which held all of the people in a sort of a religious spiritual bondage you know what I'm saying a religious spiritual bondage and we'll get into that in a little more detail so for this reason it is said now for this reason right according to um, the Ethiopic legend of Our Lady Mary it said for this reason speaking of Miriam she fell sick. Miriam fell sick. And the scab of leprosy. You understand? Know it was black turning white. A recessive skin disease and disorder took hold upon her. And she went forth outside the camp. Numbers chapter 12, verse 13. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days. She was shut outside the camp for seven days. Now there's something very interesting that's going on here. Because 
why would Miriam, who seems in the beginning part, she, she chants, notice when they cross the Red Sea, she even has a song. She's leading a group of sisters. She is like, in her own sense, she is like a goddess because in ancient Egypt, she was of that particular stature, just like Haron or Aaron was of that particular stature in ancient Egypt. And half the people, maybe even more than half, that followed them out of ancient Egypt were not just the children of Israel, but were Egyptians who, who too were in bondage, you understand, to that Amun priest, priesthood or that counterfeit Amun cult. It's like comparing Catholicism of today with his whitewashed Mary to true Christian or true Christianity of the first century. Do you see the difference? For in the law or Torah, this is said in the passage wherein it blamed Moses. Moses was blamed. Now I say that when Ha Elohim, when God, when Jah, if you please, wished to destroy Miriam because of his jealousy for his mother. So God or Yeshua, the pre incarnate or the true Amen, wished to destroy Miriam, right? Because of the name Mariam, because of his mother, Mariam, because he understood that his mother named her what he, what she named her for the reasons why she named her, which we just discussed. So God wished to destroy Miriam because of his jealousy for his mother. He sought out this means of doing it, for he did not wish her to be called by the name of his mother and many of those who have been called by the name of Mary are quite contrary or to say the daughter of Hannah have not found life. This is from this is from the Ethiopic legend of our Lady Mary one page twenty three now it says that many who have been called Mary or Mariam or even Miriam, right? The daughter of Hannah have not found life, for some of them have become possessed of devils, and some have been taken in adultery, all of which things have happened through the kina'e, or the zealousness, which they call jealousy, of Ha Elohim for his mother for the true matriarch and the true matriarchy, right? Therefore, from the earliest times, God, the true God, hath neither caused nor wished that other women should be called by the name of his mother. Now, this is very, very interesting right here. We can go into this a little bit a little bit further, but we wanted to point out that point because it's what the Holy Spirit has shown I and I while going through this particular lesson. That particular link right there in the newest publication that we have publicized, and that's the Ethiopic legend, legends of Our Lady Mary. Now, in moving forward with this, let's go over here to Macy's work right here, right? Just to move forward with this a little bit right here because we want to see how the connection of this pouring out this particular pouring out of um of the blood right the pouring out of the blood to the extent of three days voyage is a mythical mode describing the red sea the localized illustration of which was the inundation of the now when it turned red so in the scriptures, when the now turned red, we're seeing a link right here to the pouring out of the blood. Now, i got to put this into context, because the only way you can understand what's going on in the Bible or the Torah is to put it in its proper ancient Kemite context, right? There's a certain context. This is why some things are not mentioned in Torah, because they were already understood or overstood by the people who actually were there. 
You know what I'm saying? Like today we say CBS. What does CBS mean? What does IRS mean? These are all acronyms. It's like if you look at NTR in ancient Egypt, what does that mean? That's net You know what I'm saying? What I'm trying to say is that some things are understood in the cultural context of its time. So if I wrote a letter to somebody right now, or even if I'm writing a history, I say, oh, and the CBS had a, a report. Somebody a thousand years later be like, what is CBS? What is CBS? It's not the proper word. Would they know it's Columbia Broadcasting Service? You understand? Only through enough diligence and study would they be able to put that together. But at first, there would be some confusion under this. Now, this was under the protection of Mer Secker, who was the silent Mer. Notice it's Mer Secker was the silent Mer and was the image of the mother source as the now was considered to be when read and called Teshtesh, the inert, that is the feminine form of Osar or Osiris. Now the rejoicing of Hathor, which we find in the scripture to be the rejoicing of Miriam upon the crossing of the Red Sea, is connected with the rejoicing of Ahit Haru in the Egyptian, for lack of a better word, mythology, over the bloodshed is paralleled by the song and dance of Miriam over the destruction in the Red Sea. The bitter waters of Marah, which were sweetened by the tree cast into them. So we have another link right here in the Hebraic. That other important link that we have right there in the Hebraic, it just stands out, Marah the bitter water, and then we have also the Meribah, where they tried Yahweh at these bitter waters that is called the Meribah, the Meribah. Now, how does this, how does this all, how does, how does this all connect? Now, we're kind of far up in this right here. We could have actually gone back a couple of pages in um, a book of the beginnings, and perhaps we should go back a couple of pages in the book of the beginnings so that we can put this into proper into its proper context. But um, what we have right here is um, is the rejoicing of Hathor over the over the bloodshed. That's power that's a parallel in the Egyptian to what we have in the Hebrew Bible, the song and the dance of Miriam over the destruction of the so-called Egyptians in the Red Sea. The bitter waters of Marah, which were sweetened by the tree that was cast into them, it equates with the juice of the fruit that was poured into the blood of the Egyptian myth. A covenant and a statute are made on the spot in the Egyptian mythology by Re, by Re, whom whom in, um, in modern Egyptology they call him Ra, but more correctly, Re, who orders that libation is to be made to the young goddess of Amu. At every festival of the new year, at the time of the overflow of the Nile in ancient Egypt. Now, in like manner, we find this to be very interesting because in like manner, we have the Lord of Israel, the Adonai of Israel, makes for them a, quote, statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And the note is Numbers chapter 33 and 9. Now, the tree of healing is the tree of life. It's the male source that's applied by Isaiah in Isaiah 56 and 3, where it says, Neither let the eunuch say, I am a dry tree. Don't let the eunuch say, I am a dry tree. In the elder version, this is represented as the fruit of the tree whose juice was mingled, was mixed with blood was mixed with blood. Now, we've gone a little bit 
forward in this portion right here because we could have actually gone um, back a few pages to really link the first part on page 112. And on page 112, it really gives us a very, very interesting connection that when we study the ancient Egypt, right, and it kind of scrolls from, from the golden calf incident, in other words, this incident with the red heifer and the golden calf incident is very much connected. Now, in the Egyptian myth, there is the destruction that goes forth in the shape of the Hathor. Hathor, the goddess whose type was the heifer with the gilded horns. Or the golden Hathor, who was the lady of mirth and music. The lady of joy and music, song and dance. Who held the chords of love who drew all hearts to, quote, rise up and play, to rise up and play whilst beating time on the tambourine. Now, that is the very image that we have of Miriam. This is the type of image. So now we have Yeshua here and his mother. You understand? But now let us touch a little bit more on Miriam, right, on Miriam. And this picture right here that was actually on ancient clothing, it kind of fills in and can be a good stand-in, a stand-in imagery right here for this portion of the, of the Torah portion concerning the death of Miriam. Because we have to now understand why is the red heifer, you know, the red heifer and this whole sacrifice of the red heifer it seems to be intimately connected with Miriam in the scripture. Because in the next chapter, we find that Miriam, right, that Miriam, basically, she dies. And then right after her death, we find something else very curious. We find that in, in verse uh, 2, the second verse of chapter 20, we find that the Israelites, the Israelites had no water. They had no water. And once again, they begin to grumble and complain to Mashu. This is the symbol right here. We should have brought this up from the very beginning part, but as we're going through this, we're learning better to teach this and show some of the significance, because some of this is actually what I and I is, you know, what I and I is learning and discovering as we're going through these Torah portion studies. So we're sharing with the I and them much of what these studies basically are revealing, and then putting it up for academic or otherwise scrutiny and test, you understand, as long as they can reference our primary Ethiopic resources, but the problem is that many cannot access that Ethiopic resource to really verify. But those who are able to can verify it when we say Horus as Kharu. Kharu means chosen. Kharuyan means the chosen ones, or that is to say the elect ones. Right? When God says, or the Hebrew God speaks of his chosen ones, he is speaking of his elect ones. Right? Who are these elect ones? These elect ones, keely and chiefly, are these three here that we have from the Egyptian trinity. And that I think we're going to touch on as we, as we go forward in the next part of this, how Moses, Miriam, and Aaron matches, you know what I'm saying, matches this Egyptian trinity. In other words, Moses, Aaron, and, and um, Miriam, they are the Hebrew, the Hebrew version of this trinity. So to the majority of these Israelites, as well as the mixed multitude, you have to remember that they are seeing things. They are so thoroughly Egyptianized. Just like folks today are Americanized. You know what I mean? Even if they're in another land, another place, there is this kind of um, 
there is this almost uh, uh, double-mindedness, almost like they say you could take the nigga out the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of nigga, so to speak, you know what I mean? So you could take ones out of this socialization, but that socialization is already embedded, it's like it's inborn in them, and this is what we find with these Israelites, because at every single turn, at every single opportunity, it's like they're trying to find some excuse, they're trying to find some excuse to go back to Egypt one way or another, and, and we don't have to go through all the various different examples, but the examples are there, it, when they're saying, oh, we should have died in Egypt, oh, were that with such and such in Egypt, everything, everything, Egypt, we had garlic and food and leeks and onions and all this kind of food in Egypt, we don't like this kind of food that, that the angel food, oh, if we had only died in Egypt, you know, so they, they're very much caught up on Egypt, they can't escape Egypt, so how are we not to assume that the way they are looking at what's going on in these in in, in the Torah, especially in, in 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 the um this portion here, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers is not being seen and interpreted by them through an Egyptian mindset. We have to remember that the Egyptian uh, culture. Probably the only thing that compares with the Egyptian culture as it was then is the so-called American or Western culture today. That, that, in other words, so many people from all over the world have been hypnotized and actually live in the image. So they were living in the image, and one can say the shadow of Egypt. And, and just to prove this to you before we go forward with this. Who's doing a little study here? Let's bring up let's bring up um this uh Bible study program right here, right? And in this Bible study program, I think we looked up Miriam and then we go to Micah. When you go to Micah, I think it's six and four. Let's go to Micah six and four, right? Micah. Micah six and four. Now Micah six and four, what does it say? In Micah six and four it says for I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead you. Now this is interesting how the prophets, the prophets are going to clarify a whole lot including the fact that it wasn't the so-called native Egyptian that persecuted the Beta Israel or Israel or the Hebre, the Hebrews, but it was actually the Assyrian. It was the Assyrian or the Osirian, the Osirian that persecuted, you know what I'm saying, that persecuted the Israelites whom God calls my people. And just to bring that up, the Let's bring that up with the Assyrian, the Assyrian, um, the Assyrian, let's just bring this up right here, the Assyrian, it's going to be in Isaiah, Isaiah, it says, and the Assyrian persecuted, the Assyrian persecuted, and so when we find people talking about, oh, it's the Egyptians that did it, Oh, such and such and such. What do they mean by Egyptians? Like, what do you mean by American today? It's the very same thing. What do you mean? Do you mean American from England American? Or you mean somebody that just came over the other day and became American? Or somebody in a foreign country who wear jeans and eat McDonald's and feel that they're American? What kind of American are you talking about? For thus saith Adonai Yahweh, my people... So Adonijah, Adonai Yahweh, says, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, to dwell there. And the what? The Assyrian, the Osirian, the Assyrian oppressed or downpressed them without cause. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. In the beginning, my people went to live temporarily in Egypt. 
Assyria, instead of more correctly, it should be the Assyrian, oppressed them for no good reason. So when we keep reading about, you know, we keep hearing, well, the Egyptians were persecuting Egypt, let my people go. Remember, there was a king that knew not Joseph, Eoseph. E but all native Egyptians knew Joseph. But there arose a king who did not. Who was this king that arose? This is part of that mystery right there concerning this um, oppression. So clearly the scriptures, the Lord is clarifying this right here. He says that his people went down into Egypt to sojourn there, and it was the Assyrian, or overstood, it was the Osirian that oppressed them without any cause. That's what we're hearing about with the river and throwing the youths in the water, all the male youths, so forth and so on. There's a bigger picture that we need to see in this. So now we have this trinity here, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Moses, now we have Yahweh saying to the prophet Micah that he sent, he is the one that sent these three. So to those who were Egyptified, you know what I'm saying, to see these, these three right here, you know what I'm saying, we have your Hathor type, we have your Osiris type right here, which would be the Moses type, you know what I'm saying, the Moses type and the true Osar and the true Amen, and then right here, who do we have with that side lock? We have that side lock, Aaron. Remember what Yahweh says? You will be a god to Pharaoh. Remember in, in the Torah and Shemot where he says, You will be as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron will be your prophet. This is why the Harpal the Harpal Cartus or or um what do you say, Harpocrates, you understand? But that's not the Egyptian way, but that's how it's known, um, Harpo, right? You, you reverse that, it's Oprah, but that's not what it's talking about here. The role of the Sidelock right here is that Horus or that chosen one, because what did Aaron become? Aaron became the high priest. You know what I'm saying? He became the high priest, the only one who can go in to the Holy of Holies, why? Because he already was familiar with that order out of Egypt. So then it makes sense even much more why there seems to be this um, kind of um, antagonism. Like the people like Mo uh, Miriam and Aaron. And Miriam and Aaron seem to reflect more of the people's view. Even the mixed multitude, even the rebels at times point of view. Why is this so? Because you have to remember that Moses, he went to the root, he went to the deeper truth, and he was able now to overstand that. And this is why we have in the Hebrew Bible something that Macy had 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 said that was kind of interesting that I want to just put into the um, put into the notes right here. I don't know if I had highlighted it. But he was saying that, you know, we should really thank, we should really thank the, um, the Hebrews because what the Hebrew Bible or the Hebrew Scripture actually helps us to do is to really understand a kind of a ancient, ancient, in a sense, I hate to use this word because people misunderstand this evolution but more like a cultural evolution or the evolution of mythological ideas. You understand? Almost like anthropology in another sense, but also sociology. You understand? Cultural sociology can also be very, very much, um, very much uh, understood. I don't know if, I, if, if I'm able to get that part right now, but... I found that, and it was kind of very interesting when we start to look at some of the the symbolism. For those who have this particular book, you know how Macy Macy writes. You know, but then you really have to study. You know, his work. It's just sort of like a volume of of information. You have to pick it pick it apart and put it together for whatever you're particularly focused on. Like we're focused right now on Miriam right, in the scripture, so when we go to 
this searchable PDF right here and we hit search right here for the next um, Miriam um, the next Miriam um, 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 point right here find it there it's there let's see how many pages we go ahead now right here is interesting too because it's kind of linked with that very same part which is the Torah portion right now it says that this agrees with the change in the name of the rock of the water from the Sir or the Sir, the Sir in the time of Miriam to the Sila. So we have the name of that rock. You remember the rock is the third part, the water from the rock. Now the rock in the New Testament sense is symbolic of Christ. And Moses striking the rock is symbolic of the Jews, the, the Jewish um, priesthood or the authority crucifying Christ. And with the religious establishment crucifying the Messiah. It's almost similar to Christ's parable about the husbandmen. They were put in charge to guard it, but after a while they took ownership of it. Do you understand? And then they killed, they killed the ear, in other words. So now, it's touching on the letter L. You know, say now, you might just know L. You'll say L is loser, right? But the L of the capital English written alphabet is apparently derived from the hieroglyphic pet, the pet, which is the tail of the lion. The lion became the phonetic L of the Ptolemaic inscriptions. R and L are interchangeable. Like if you ever hear certain people, like certain Asians will say, instead of I love you, they might say, I love you, I love you. Or you can hear how the French speak when they say the R, and you could hear that R and L interchanges. In Chinese, the L answers for the R. So in Chinese, when, it, when they're transcribing something that has an R, instead it will be spelt with a, a L. So when they say Ling, it's actually a Ren, like a Ren in ancient Egypt, but not to go too deep in that. In Japanese, it's the R for the L. And here we have a remarkable connection between the two. Both appear to be derived from the lion. Now, when you start to study even with this vid that we're talking about, pyramid, pyramid code, and the pyramid code is very interesting, too, because it says that the only constellation that becomes like an anchor is the Leo constellation. What we would say, Moa and Bethlehem, Negeti, Yehuda. The lion becomes that that constellation that becomes the marker, you understand, to really re reorder or, or realign the ancient understanding with our so called modern understanding. Now the hieroglyphic ru is it is a mouth. The ru is a mouth in, in ancient hieroglyphic, like the lips, the mouth. And pe or rum. Pe is the rum and it's also, it's the rump, the backside, right, or the hinder part of a lion, but it's also a mouth of the lioness. It's also the mouth of the lioness, but there are two mouths, no pun intended, two pairs, two lions, or a dual one, the double truth. The ruru, ruru, is the horizon as the place of the two lions or the dual one. Almost remind me of the Ishururu. Ishururu, which is the lullaby, Ethiopian lullaby, Aruru. Right now, the horizon is double. The horizon is a double horizon. One mouth in front and one behind, represented by the double mouth of the lion. Hence, the two mouths are figured by R and L, from which it appears that the R and L meet as one in the lion, and are two as signs of the duality of the lion of the double horizon or horizon. The lion was first, was feminine at first. When we look at the sphinx, people say the sphinx is like, some say, it's a lion, some say it's a dog. It's very interesting. It's really a feminine lion, if you understand, if you take the body. 
the lion was feminine at first, doubly feminine, and later it was male-female. The lion of the hinder part, the north region, is called Shu on heart. He wears the hinder part of the lion as his symbol. The lion or lioness of the forepart is Tefnut. Consequently, the ru or the r sound, which is the mouth, is feminine, and the l of the hinder part is masculine. This agrees with the change in the name of the rock of water. Remember the rock of water that 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 Moses struck instead of speaking to it, they hit it because they got fed up finally with these naysayers. Because remember how often Yahweh was saying, let me destroy them and make a great nation out of you, Moses. In other words, we would have had an Ethiopian Hebrew nation from such a time. But Moses, he went to the mercy side of the tree. You know what I'm saying? But notice what happened. By having mercy on those rebels, he basically almost lost he did lose his access at that time to the promised land. So the name of the rock of water, the Tsar, or the Tsir, the Tsar, in the time of Marian was changed to the Sila, like Sela, Sila, under Moses when he struck the rock. The change from Miriam to Moses, from Tsar to Sila, from female to male, correspond to the hieroglyphic nature of the R and the L when both are derived from the lion. It is probable that the Hebrew lion...